Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. That's right. Welcome to Science Faction 35, the Science Faction without a name. Oh, how mysterious. We're getting creative. I, like I know. It. I am your host, archaeologist and comedian Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is our lovely research scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing tonight? Hi. I'm doing well. I would like to take a moment for a little bit of rest in peace for Joan Rivers. Oh, that's right. We just found I, out today that Miss you know, Rivers passed. As a comedic female. I feel like she's she's an icon in the area, and she was always making me laugh, and thanks a lot, Joan. And well, she was a badass biomedical research scientist as well. She was a badass in general. Yeah. I mean, she was just fucking cool. That other voice you hear is none other than our comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how does it feel to know you'll never be as funny as Joan Rivers? Not even close. I feel like today's the first day I could be funnier than Joan Rivers. <laughs> yeah. And probably that is, every day that, from here on out. That is true. Oh. Well, she's got a few left in her, I think. <laughs> I, I believe she might have tattooed some jokes on her body like Memento, just oh, in case. totally. <sighs> give, it, give it some time. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, as always, we are broadcasting from our beautiful studio here at the Madhouse Comedy Club in downtown San Diego on the top of Horton Plaza. If you guys ever come on out to San Diego, come catch a show out here. It is one of the best comedy clubs in the country and an yes. awesome place to broadcast from. Let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles. This is Science Articles. All right, guys, we got an interesting set of articles this week. It ranges from archaeology through biology and psychology. Some very interesting stuff that kind of changes some of the science we used to know. Let's get right into it, starting with settling the Arctic. Damien, if you could live in one place, I think it would be the Arctic, right? It's because I sweat so you much. You sweat yeah. so much here in regular places. I feel like the Arctic would be good for you. The way things are going, if the polar bear can't live there any longer, where am I going to go? Yeah. yeah. Like, me and the polar bear thrive in the same environment. Yeah. That's true. You guys play a lot of cards together. You collect Coke cans. <laughs> you, you play around in the snow during Christmas. Eat yeah. walrus. Yeah. All yeah. that kind of stuff. Well, it turns out that people have been living in the Arctic, and we've known this for a while, for about 5,000 years. 5,000 years ago is You're when talking you- about the elves, right? The elves, Santa. but also paleo-Eskimos. Oh. oh, okay. And these paleo-Eskimos have been living there for 5,000 years. Now, those of you who are familiar with kind of human migration might be thinking to yourself, but wait, haven't people been in the Americas for fifteen to 20,000 years? They have at least that long, but they didn't move up into the Arctic until that badass place until about 5,000 years ago. <laughs> All the good property was taken. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so you had to move up. It's technically beachside, but it's very cold. <laughs> so amongst the Native American people, the Paleo Eskimos are kind of like, you know, they're living out in the trailer park of, uh, of the Arctic. Yeah, but they're uh, living okay. in the trailer park where you got to know what the fuck you're doing in order to survive. So they've been living there for 5,000 years, and we know that all of a sudden, 1,000 years ago, the people that we call the Inuit now, the, or the people that now occupy that area, moved in. They moved in only a thousand years ago, so when we think of, of those people up there, we have to remember that that's a relatively recent migration. Mm -hmm. They come in, and all of a sudden, that culture that was there, those Paleo-Eskimos that had been there for four or five thousand years, they disappear. Now, most of the time in archaeology, when we start studying this, we find later through genetic testing or through tool use or through culture that those cultures combined in some way or another. That happens in almost every instance. Almost every time a new group moves in, they don't just kill everybody off. They mate with whoever's there. They create a new culture, and they bond, and they become this new thing. So for a long time, we had a couple of questions about these Paleo-Eskimos. Number one, where did they come from? Were they Native Americans who moved up north? How did they kiss? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Question number two, did they interbreed with those Inuit coming in a thousand years to create the modern Inuit that we have now? Or were they completely wiped out? A and just basically how they lived and where they came from. Well, a new study came out of the University of Copenhagen that looks at the genetics of this and finally gives us a definitive answer. For those of us in archaeology, this is a very exciting study. And he finds out that indeed there wasn't any breeding. The Inuit did not breed with the Paleo-Eskimos. These are two giant groups. Put this in perspective. When human beings come into the Middle East, they start fucking Neanderthals and Denozivians <laughs> and every other species they can find. That explains a lot. But actually. somehow these two groups of human beings living in the same area for an overlap of a decent amount of time 
don't breed even once that we can tell. Perhaps the paleo Eskimos were just as enticed by the thought of an Eskimo bathing suit calendar as we were. Oh. Like maybe maybe it was just like I. Oh, <laughs> but they like their own paleo Eskimo oh, yeah. bathing suit calendar. Yeah, yeah. Just not like anyone else's. Maybe the paleo Eskimos were a, lo- a tall, blonde-headed people yeah. with uh, with curves like na- like hourglass figures. And <laughs> well, actually, it's funny. Some of the, the some of the information we get about paleo Eskimos comes from the Inuit, who still tell us stories about them, and their descriptions of them were that they were big, tall humans that. Even though they were bigger and taller than the Inuit, were scared of them and would run away from them. Maybe they just had really strong mothers that wouldn't let them date outside of their <laughs> circles. That, or maybe they were afraid of catching short and squat. <laughs> like that was a disease, right? So this is really exciting because it means there's at least three major migrations from Siberia into the Americas. We have the obviously the primary one, in which uh, is, is actually more accurately from Beringia, but from that eastern edge of Russia, in which. Uh, groups of people came in fifteen to 20,000 years ago and occupied all of the Americas to become the natives that we know. They lived there for a long time. Then 5,000 years ago, another group from Siberia makes the migration over. They become the Paleo Eskimos, and they occupy only the Arctic areas. Then, 1,000 years ago, what we call the Inuit, they migrate over and completely eradicate those Paleo Eskimos. So at least three separate large major migrations from the Eastern Asian area into the Americas over the last 20,000 years. That's a very cool thing to know. That's very exciting scientific research. And I got a couple of questions for my panelists about this. Question number one. Again, we talked about the fact that these guys didn't mate. Mm -hmm. This is incredibly rare in human history that such a thing would happen. Why do you think the Inuit and Paleo Eskimos chose not to get it on? Well, I feel like Damien is on the right course. You know, there was some physicality about the Paleo Eskimos, the Inuit, you know, weren't into. Oh, like like didn't have big enough butts. Yeah, yeah, like not enough junk in the trunk. I could see that. But but because they were still burly, you know, and the Inuit were probably just around this time getting the idea of the dog sledding, they just entrapped all of them and forced them to pull sleds until they went extinct. And then they're like, you know what? Let's just go with dogs. You guys want to know something super random? And I can tell you that Jackie does not know this. I did not tell her this before. One of the reasons the Inuit were so much more successful than the Paleo Eskimos is they came in with dogs and dog sleds. So very, very interesting thing. Well, the the Paleo Eskimos had dogs. It was just mostly chihuahuas. Like, it, you, good luck pulling a fucking <laughs> yeah. sled with that. a dog. <laughs> okay, I agree with you, but... For the record, the Paleo Eskimos didn't have chihuahuas. Damien, why do you think the two didn't mate? Well, I think, that, you know, they looked and they said these people are better at hunting whales than us. They're better at exploiting the land and resource. You know, we could either have two choices. We can either mate with their women uh-huh. or we can go back into the sea. And uh-huh. they did. And that's how we get belugas. <laughs> <laughs> Beluga whales are paleo Eskimos who have somehow evolved. Wow. Prove wow. me wrong, science. <laughs> it's very easy to do. As The single genetic test would do Dead. that very easily. Yeah. Also common sense. Well, All science right. is afraid to do that test, which is why I'm still right. Uh-huh. Uh, interesting definition of the word right. Let's go on to question number two. <laughs> question number two. Unfortunately, we now know that a widely dispersed, large, and long-lasting culture was completely eradicated off the face of the earth by an invading people 1,000 years ago. Is it justifiable to claim the later European invasion that did almost as much damage to the Inuit themselves was just payback for the Paleo Eskimos? I think it's pretty clearly that's... What happened? Do you think the Europeans, they were gut, they came with like open arms. We're going to have a new society in which we all treat each other really well. And then they're like, wait, what happened to those Paleo Eskimo dudes we hung out with a thousand years ago? Yeah. And the Inuit are like, we killed them. And the Europeans were like, oh, it's on. No, not, but even worse, we won't even fuck them. Like, oh, like okay. that's, yeah. that's the real. Yeah, at least. Have you seen how they kiss? Like, what are we. Like, <laughs> How bad do your teeth have to be? You know what? Just on on the nose. (laughs) That's true. The Europeans may have brought smallpox, but they also brought dick because they did interbreed with the other natives. Yeah, and some better looking women. Okay. Damien, what do you think? I think the early Europeans, they had no idea about the Paleo Eskimos, but what they did love was whales. Mm. And they looked and saw these people killing Yeah, the Inuit hunting whales. Yeah, harmless right whales. and. And they would actually sympathize then with the Paleo Eskimos because one of the other technologies the Paleo Eskimos didn't have that the Inuit had was whale hunting with large uh, harpoon type weapons. So they probably came and said, hey, our Viking friends stopped by here and everybody was cool what? just hanging out, not fucking up any whales. Now you guys are killing. Them. And they look at them the same way we look at the Japanese. 100%. Okay. Is it, is it possible? I mean, going back to why they didn't breed, perhaps Eskimo genitals both look like noses. Oh, okay. Both male and female it takes a real expert to tell a, you know, a female versus male Eskimo genitalia. That would explain the breeding. I see. I see. <laughs> Question number three. It seems like the American immigration problem over the last few dozen millennium have been from Russia rather than Latin America. 
how will we change our immigration policies to reflect this? Everybody go through the Ukraine. <laughs> it's a bit longer That's, of a route. That is quite a route. <laughs> Please make stop in Ukraine. Uh, don't fly over it, though. <laughs> well, to be fair, there hasn't been an invasion from the Russias in a bit. Yeah. The, the and, I know, and I know why. Why is that? In order, so in order to stop this, we're going to move the Palin family to Texas, just right along the border to prevent oh. the Latin Americans from coming through, because they've stopped the Russians for generations. Sarah Palin single-handedly is stopping the Russians from coming in. <laughs> if we bring her down to the southern border, she would then stop yeah. Mexicans from coming in. But you have to bring the moose she's standing on with one, you know, one knee up. Okay. Oh well, the moose is riding a snowmobile. She's on the moose. <laughs> okay. Using the uh, antlers as several gun racks. Uh-huh. You know, she has a bow and arrow up there, a <laughs> rifle, a shotgun. She has a, all the tools for keeping out foreigners. Yeah. That sounds like a logical and completely sensible reason why the, what we could do. <laughs> yeah, I'm embarrassed about my Ukraine answer now. Yeah, that, that just seems – you were great. absurd. <laughs> <laughs> on to story number two, nature, nurture, placebo. Very interesting study. I always like these because these are these very neat studies that tell you what your abilities are and how you get in your own way. So uh, a new study suggests that whether you believe in nature or nurture as the primary gauge of outcome actually has an effect on the outcome itself. So forget the question of nature or nurture. Ask, do you believe in nature or nurture? Mm -hmm. That's almost more important. So let me explain how this works. Some researchers from Michigan State University wanted to test the effectiveness of preconceived notions of intelligence affecting the outcomes of a certain test. So they had two groups start the test by reading very different articles, one that suggested intelligence is all genetic and one that suggested it was environmental factors at work and your work ethic. Is everybody of the same general intellect? Think of an RCT, perfectly randomly controlled study. So. The participant, while wearing brain monitoring devices, then took a test based on what they had learned. So they're wearing those skull caps, you know, with all the little wires pulling out of like them. Like the one Rick Moranis wore in Ghostbusters. That's gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yep, makes sense. Uh, or the one Rick Moranis wore in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids too. Or the one Rick Moranis wore in Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. And similar to the hat Rick Moranis wore in Strange Brew. <laughs> Rick Moranis has it in his writer. Like, I need to wear a hat with wires coming out. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Rick Moranis, while wearing this brain monitoring device, then took a test on what they had learned, those who were told it was genetic cared more about getting the answer right, and they spent a longer time on their answers, but they got more of them wrong. The brain scanners revealed that those who were told intelligence was mainly based on hard work showed a more efficient brain response after making a mistake, which may have helped them recover and move on better. Previous studies have showed similar findings, including that telling a child who got the right answer in class that they were, quote-unquote, so smart caused them to be less successful than telling them they were, quote-unquote, a hard worker. It's thought that children who believe intelligence is their inherent characteristic do less well with mistakes and are actually less likely to put themselves in situations where they can then be wrong. A couple of questions for my panelists. Question number one. Studies like this are interesting because they suggest that we should compliment children very carefully. What currently unknown tactic will you use to motivate kids to learn? I prefer the very hush hush, you know, not not widely known uh, method of beating. Just beat them, yeah. Yeah, I was beat pretty well as a kid, and huh? I like to think I turned out better for it. Okay, so you're going with the Mexican route. Uh, uh, see, okay, see, I, I'm just really surprised because that implies that your Mexican mother gave a shit about how you performed in school. Oh, she did. It was a reflection on her, after all. <laughs> Uh, like, I thought maybe you like went like I, you don't even look like you're ready to breed by twelve. Like look at what you're wearing. It's like you don't even give a shit about attracting a man. Get over here. Get the belt. I did breed at twelve, Damien. I'm all done. Thanks. <laughs> Just a reminder. Technically, both of these people are Mexican. <laughs> Damien, what kind of previously unknown tactic would you use to help k- motivate kids to learn? Well, I guess it depends on what we're trying to learn. Like for example, I want my kid. Like I want my kid to live a long happy life you know find a good wife have kids things like that mm-hmm. so i'm gonna call him gay every day okay mm-hmm. it's that way he'll work that hard to prove me wrong yeah so he'll you, you think that calling him gay will make him incredibly straight which i don't think is a thing but you, you think that would push him to then be very very straight and then give you grandchildren is, is that the goal if i believe that heterosexuality was was genetic mm-hmm. you know uh-huh. to compare it to this study sure then it means nothing i'm setting him up for failure okay. but if i tell him that heterosexuality is, oh, is hard work yes. is about hard work uh-huh. yeah then you'll and, then he'll he'll 
pursue okay. heterosexuality. What if you tell him that, though, and he decides, my dad is such an asshole by harassing me all the time, I'm going to be gay since it's just a choice, like you're Which saying. Is also then I'll send him to work. a Christian education camp that will straighten that out. And, and my hope is that one day he'll run that camp <laughs> and marry Michelle Bachman. <laughs> Dreaming big. Dreaming big. Especially because how old she'll be at that time. I don't even have a kid. <laughs> Question number two. If calling people smart can make them dumb on tests, maybe this is just a very elaborate form of reverse psychology. If that is the case, I have a proclamation for my genetically intelligent panelists. I absolutely refuse for any of you to give me extensive and physically demanding sexual favors, no matter how much you beg to do so. One. Is that a question? Sort of. Two, nobody tells me what to do. Get over here. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I took know. my headset I mean, off to walk I over there. I don't see how saying? this is different. I still end up watching you guys have sex. <laughs> He's a little disappointed. He was staring at you as he, as he was dropping that hint. He actually kind of put his hand up blocking me. Oh, that's so, sweet. Some, some people are too smart for the gag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at her over there. Dumb old Jackie not giving Bobby a hand job. <laughs> yeah. Doing exactly what Bobby says. All Such right. a pawn. <laughs> On to story number three. Smart skin. A new study in Nature Neuroscience shows something really, really interesting. Turns out the neurons in human skin, the stuff that's in your arms and your legs that's just on your skin, it can perform calculations previously thought only possible in the brain. Your skin is thinking. Oh, God. And think about going out in the sun, just burning it. Yeah. Just, just ruining all Huge that dick move. smarts. First order neurons. My skin is genetically very smart, by the way. <laughs> First order neurons in the skin connect to multiple sensitive zones in the skin. These neurons were thought to only transmit data on when and how an object is touched. In other words, yes or no. This thing is, you feel a touch, you don't. You do, you don't. But this new research shows that it actually processes all of that data and sends information about things like the object's shape to the brain directly. So the brain doesn't have to process that information coming in. It's getting processed in your fucking skin and sent to your brain. Your skin is a computer. This type of processing was long thought My skin to... would be a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Long would do advertisements for your skin. <laughs> this type of processing was long thought to be the realm of only the brain for good reason. Who would think that your skin could process data? This is very interesting. Some questions for my panelists. Your skin is smarter than we thought. If your skin had sentience and the ability to speak, what would it tell others about you? So get this. Every three to four weeks, this bitch takes me to some salon. She lies down on a table. She has hot wax poured all over me and then <laughs> rips out all the hair that I've been working weeks to grow. Also, she can screw the same guy who agreed to screw her for the rest of her life. <laughs> but she doesn't do that to scalp skin. No, no. <laughs> That skin, that skin too, and she leaves that shit alone. So your skin would, would just uh, complain about waxing and fucking. Those are the two things that it'd really be bothered by. I also it's like so how you're sweaty. S- it's so sweaty. I like how your skin is kind of slutty. Your skin's like, why are you fucking the same guy? Pick this new dude. Come I mean, on. If you're gonna go through all the trouble yeah. of ripping me out every three weeks. Meanwhile, he's ja- nice and all, but come on. Yeah, let's get something new in here. Meanwhile, Jackie's upper lip skin is like, come on, I'm in the same ballpark. Please just leave me. Let me grow. <laughs> Damien, what about you? What do you think that your skin would tell other people if it was sentient? Well, I feel like the new phrenology is going to be like a, a subset of dermatology, and people are going to look at my ex of and say, well, he's not clearly not fit for this job. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll gauge your intelligence by your skin eczema? Yeah. yeah, and if you get like a rash on the knee, it'll, it'll be treated like a traumatic brain injury. <laughs> but, this guy. but to be fair, as we just learned, all somebody would have to t- tell you is that it's hard work and you could get rid of that eczema. And you <laughs> that's would do right. It. Maybe your eczema, maybe that's your skin retaliating against you. For all my drinking, gotcha. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I feel like your skin would have a lot more stories. I feel like it would oh, I feel like it would ask a lot of questions like why am I always covered in this goo? Yeah. Why am I always chafed? Maybe you could put me inside of a woman for once. <laughs> <laughs> Question number 2. Does this discovery trivialize the old saying that certain differences are only skin deep? Will this reinvigorate the pseudoscience of racists attempting to highlight the difference in different ethnic groups based on their skin? I don't think so. Is it really? I mean, I don't think it's different. Well, imagine this. What if, I mean, listen, you take somebody who's already got that racist backing, right? Let's just take some random person in here like me. Okay. Uh And then I, and then I see somebody and they're a different skin color. Now I can go instead of just saying, oh, they're different on the outside. 
their skin is dumb. That is dumb, dark skin. <laughs> That's why they're dumb. Racist win. I think it will, but it's it's not gonna. You think it's gonna affect black people? They have wonderful skin. It, less damage from the sun. Yeah. But want, under it, the racist mind, that would be a justification. They'd be like, yeah, but that skin is not as smart. Well, maybe if he's really ashy, like in the elbows okay. or something. But I think that, hey, a, that is hardworking skin. <laughs> That's right. But I think it's going to have the bigger effect of giving dermatologists respect in the medical community. Oh, finally. Oh, finally. You're right, because neurology is one of the most respected forms <laughs> right. of, of the medical profession. Dermatology, one of the least respected. If all of a sudden the dermatologists are almost neurologists, mm -hmm. they're going to get a huge boost. There's going to be a lot of Jewish parents who are pretty disappointed in their son that are now yeah. very proud of him. That My son's a episode. dermatologist. Oh. <laughs> oh, is he single? So, Jackie, what about you? You don't think they're going to be more racist because of this? You don't think that we're going to think of dark oh, well, skin as being let me dumb? Let rephrase. The people who are already set on racism, sure, will get more racist. <laughs> but I don't think it's actually going to provide any sort of justification. I think that you can explain that away pretty quickly. Yeah, there are certain people that just require a very gentle nudge into racism. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Just, just the tipping point. Well, they're on the racist fence. <laughs> <laughs> Who was elected president? <laughs> Question number three. The skin itself is directly controllable by the brain in certain animals, like cuttlefish, octopi, and mystiques, allowing all <laughs> that rare that rare organism allowing all to directly control the color, texture, and shape of their skin. Who was the hotter mystique, Rebecca Romaine Stamos or Jennifer Lawrence? I have to go, Jennifer Lawrence. You think the young well, mystique? J well, J Law can do no wrong for me. Also, yeah. I think that Jennifer Lawrence has perfect breasts. And, like, as Mystique, I liked hers the best. Okay. I also can't stand Rebecca Romaine's voice. Well, Picture first of all, I, I want to contest your, your use of the word perfect. Uh-huh, uh, yeah. Because usually perfect doesn't also equate with way too small. Damien? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> okay, Picture Mystique is a superhero, but she morphs a T-shirt onto her. You wouldn't know, like, the contours of her breast. What's the point of Mystique if she's wearing a T-shirt? She can make her look like she's wearing anything. <laughs> but the question is it. It's who's to hotter. Me, Which one was hotter? It's okay. who's hotter. You think it was, you think it was the young... I think it's j -Law. I'm okay. going to go with Rebecca Romaine. Yeah. And the reason is because of the Stamos part. Mm. Yeah, because you want to fuck down Stamos. That's, that's right. Why. It gets me a step closer to Stamos. Yeah. No, that's my long-term... That's my bucket list. Yeah. The last one. You Bang just Stamos. asked him this because you wanted him to admit it on the air. Uh, no, we used to play the game like six degrees of John Stamos' penis. Yeah. And Damien always wanted to get right there. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to be saying to myself... I wouldn't care if Uncle Jesse touched me. Yeah. I wouldn't tell a soul. No. It'd be our little secret. It would be fantastic. I would have to agree on the Stamos thing just because I think she looks too young. Like, Jennifer Lawrence, Jennifer looks, too Lawrence young looks too young as Mystique. Like, you, she doesn't look hot. She looks like an attractive young girl, but she doesn't have the hotness to her yet. Well, to be fair, she was playing the young Mystique. That's what I'm saying. You know, she looks too young. You, you, women don't, they don't seem attractive until they're like 25. Then they seem like, yeah. Well, you see her nude photos. They actually, you know, some were ripped off her phone. Others right, yeah. were ripped off Winter's Bone, that porn oh, she yeah, had where she yeah. blew Santa. <laughs> yeah, she got nominated for an Oscar for that. <laughs> To be fair, it was a wonderful blowjob. <laughs> it was an excellent performance. <laughs> we can't agree, though, that either one, you're going to want to fuck either one of those mystiques, right? Yeah. Okay. Hunt, I mean, there's no question. if John Stamos isn't available, yeah. yeah. I'd like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know what John Stamos loves is the lightning round. <gasps> he does. I read that somewhere. <laughs> you subscribe to J Stamos Monthly? I knew you'd be a fellow member. Greek heartthrobs. Gotta love them. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard the show, the lightning round is where I ask my panelists a one to two sentence question, and they respond with a one to two sentence answer. Are you guys ready to play? Mm. All right. Question number one. Scientists have found that this substance increases the effectiveness of THC on the brain. What substance is it? The fourth meal at Taco Bell. <laughs> Wow, well, that would make sense because certainly 80 to 92% of all people going to get fourth meal at Taco Bell are high. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I guess you could be really drunk. That could be an option. Yeah, I mean, they don't even serve you food unless they smell smoke in the air yeah. at the yeah. drive-thru. Yeah, you can make the case. If they come up and they're like, wait, you don't seem to be high, you could be like, I swear I'm drunk. And they'll be like, we'll let you pass. We gave some food to a morbidly obese dude who wasn't intoxicated in any way. I felt real bad about it, but, yeah. you know, we got to make a living here at Taco Bell. So, so they get the high guys get there and they buy a 14 cent bean and cheese burrito, and that ups the effect of the THC. Yeah, that's right. Wow, that's economical. People should really, you know what? Advertisement for 
for Taco Bell, guys. If you're smoking I'm, weed, yeah. get out there because apparently Always that's going to really cut down on your weed costs. You know what? Next Definitely time, next time you roll a joint, use a use the double decker taco approach. A, cun- <laughs> a weed in the middle, a yeah. crunchy taco, and then a soft che- taco. Layer of cheese, then the- <laughs> a layer of beans as an adhesive to keep the. Yeah, yeah. Flour tortilla and the corn tortilla together. Absolutely, Jackie. What about you? What do you think increases the effectiveness of THC on the brain? Uh, brownies. <laughs> Everyone knows a body high is way, way more effective. So they put it in the brownies not just to have a good tasting no, thing, but like because the brownies themselves. Both yeah. of those food answers very interesting. A lot of, a lot of. Damon and I have never, I mean, smoked pot, so we don't. I mean, we just took a shot. Yeah, <laughs> we'll address that after the show. We'll correct that. We've never smoked together. All right. Well, the actual answer: estrogen. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Fuck you, Jackie. He's <laughs> looking good now, boys. That just, Coming to my van. That just means you get less. Uh, well, that's it. I'm getting the sex change. That, that was, <laughs> that's I was on the, the fence. That's the Research, John Stamos sex change. Researchers using THC on mice found out that female mice expressing estrogen had a 30% higher impact as far as pain-killing properties of the THC on their brain. You ladies have it good. You know what? Female privilege. Yeah, yeah. That's all you I got what? to say. That's almost Female worth privilege. bleeding monthly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could smoke pot as much as I have a period, yeah. it would even itself out. Well, but to be fair, you do get the increased benefit of pot. We don't, and we still have to hear you guys talk about the bleeding monthly. So oh, who really true. loses out? That's true. Question number two. German beer has been found to now be contaminated with what? Socialism. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean they give the beer out for free? I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. No, no, they're just, it's like a roofie. Okay. You know, so they're just trying to spread it to the masses. German beer is contaminated with austerity measures. <laughs> <laughs> so is there less beer? Is, do you get a bottle of beer and it's only three quarters full? <laughs> Listen, until everybody has to pitch in if we're going to dig ourselves out of this crisis. <laughs> out that or Angela Merkel piss, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> the crisis of the U.S. spying on us. I don't know if it's a contamination, if it's piss. <laughs> the actual answer, and this was a survey done looking at a bunch of beers already in grocery stores, 24 brands of German beer in grocery stores, contaminated with microplastics. We've talked mm. about this before in terms of micro beads, but these are also small little bits of plastic, smaller than five millimeters. They're around, guess what percentage of the 24 German beers were contaminated with microplastics, guys? 100. 100 fucking percent. I knew it. Those Germans fucking shit. No, it's those waters. <laughs> Basically, the water. German of the, water? No, I just think they did it in Germany. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I think this would probably be true wherever you did it. Uh, we've been throwing a bunch of plastic in the water, especially microplastics from co- cosmetics. Mm-hmm. And we are ruining the waters with a bunch of plastic. And now it's in our beers. So See, maybe now, that'll make people pay yeah, attention. Now that you're ruining beer, yeah. shit's about to get real. Somebody's finally going to make a stop now. Yeah. Question number three. Studies have indicated that humans have made this natural phenomenon 1,000 times worse. What is it? I feel uh, global warming. I global feel like warming? It has oh. to be on the list. Playing it safe? Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, Why swing for the fences? We only need a single. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let's hear it, Ace. All right. Humans have made this natural phenomenon 1,000 times worse. Yeah, that's the question. Naturally occurring anthropomorphic amphibians trained in ninjutsu. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So the Ninja Turtle phenomenon, which uh-huh. occasionally happens in nature, has been increased by humans. What do we do a that makes that happen? Well, times. Well, a thousand, thousand times. A thousand times. We released ooze, which is a mutagen, into the okay. sewers. Oh. And that has and, – and also technically I guess we came up with Ninjutsu too. I mean the turtles <laughs> couldn't have got that on their own. <laughs> yeah. They just if went you, down to Brazil. They yeah. all. If a million anthropomorphic turtles t- learn to fight, yeah. one of them is bound to discover Ninjutsu. Yeah. If there was an infinite amount of anthropomorphic turtles on an infinite amount of typewriters, <laughs> eventually one would write the script to a horrible Michael Bay movie. <laughs> Transformers. <Yeah>. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> the actual answer, extinctions. We previously thought that they were almost 100 times worse by human standards. Extensive studies of the life forms that were around before human beings have shown 1,000 times. The extinctions that we are causing are 1,000 times worse than the natural extinction That's levels. That's what happened to the turtles. Yeah. They were well, extinct. No. Exactly. Well, to be fair, we humans need more room to kick up our, our legs. You know, like we have, we, <laughs> there are right. more species, less leg room. Uh, but well, though I must mention this just out of solidarity of something that Jackie brought up, there actually was also another study published that I almost had on this episode that the amount of assurance that we have that human beings are contributing to climate change has actually gone up to 99.999. We are yeah. that sure. 99.999% sure instead of just 99% sure. 
<laughs> that human beings are causing global warming. I don't so buy- that is close to a right answer, Jackie. Oh, thank you. I Thanks. don't buy into anything right. unless no, it's No, no, Damien, it feels good to be right. I just wanted you to know that. 99 <laughs> isn't 100. And that leads us right into corrections. And now it's time for corrections, where we address Jackie's mistakes. Okay, very interesting one. This isn't our normal correction segment because we didn't. It's not really a mistake that we made, but I was listening back and to it's last. It's certainly a mistake I didn't make. When yeah. I that out. Well, most mistakes. Are, you make most mistakes <laughs> through us. You guys have been taking my lead and just not making mistakes. Gotcha. <laughs> I was re-listening to last week's episode, and we were talking about that really interesting radio lab with the dolphins, and I was like, ah, you know, I wish they had elaborated it more, and then I was like, wait, I'm a fucking scientist, I can go read something. <laughs> I have access to <laughs> academic journals. Maybe I shouldn't wish. No, no. Yeah. If I can't download it on iTunes, it didn't happen. Yeah, maybe uh, instead of telling everybody else on a science podcast that listened to me to explain science, <laughs> oh, I wish I knew about this thing, I should go look it up. So I did, and I How wanted to elaborate on the dolphin research where they gave the dolphin LSD. If you remember, I was speaking about some research that was done in the 60s and 70s in which they were living with dolphins and they were trying to teach them how to speak. And one of the things they did, like apparently they did all the time in the 60s and 70s, is did a bunch of experiments with dolphins and acid. So this is really interesting stuff. It's horrific. Dipping dolphins in acid? (laughs) Just come out with dolphin bones? (laughs) Well, definitely in Japan. Well, we have to do enough to prove it's a controlled (laughs) stuff. This dolphin researcher was John C. Lilly, and he writes uh, about administering LSD to dolphins. I actually looked up his original research and read through some of the papers that he wrote. He didn't publish in the traditional sense, but he did uh, basically write his results out. He would speak with other LSD researchers, and they would provide their information (laughs) and, and the stuff that they got. The, they just it, all got together and did LSD. Yeah, basically. <laughs> now, we talked about before that dolphins do drugs on their own. They do this pufferfish drug right. that trips them out. So he was helping them out a little bit. But, and, and he did a very scientific study. I mean, he talks about mm-hmm. the dosages per weight. They monitor them very, very closely. He talks about an increase in respiration, an increase in vocalizations, and an increase in repeat vocalizations. So once they're on LSD, if you get in the water, they're going to talk to you more or try and talk to you. If you make a noise, they're going to try and respond to it a lot more. So they have something else going on in their head than is normally going on, obviously. They also do the same thing we heard high dolphins do with the puffer fish, where they kind of push their head out of the water and they look at their reflection in the water. Maybe that's a weird self-reflective meta-analysis in a way. Uh Make prehensile penis shadows. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he talked about them being more social, more anything. Another thing he talked about, which is interesting because we've addressed this before, is the effect on trauma, so PTSD type stuff. We know that people have been using hallucinogens in humans to help with end of life care, so people right. are very scared of dying. Yeah, people folks. with PTSD from war or from horrible traumatic injuries, they found that hallucinogens help them get over those. Well, he did an experiment with a dolphin who had been shot with a spear gun three times in its <gasps> tail. And this dolphin was petrified of humans. It wouldn't come close to humans. And they gave it some LSD. And Wait, all- wait. How did they non-threateningly catch this terrified dolphin? You just train another dolphin. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, okay. So we shot him with a spear to get him yeah, in. Yeah, that's right. But wh- whatever. He was traumatized. He no, sat he... there and let us reload twice. What the fuck did you expect us to do? I imagine the dolphin had been injured and, and they got him while he was injured. <laughs> So they gave him some LSD, and this dolphin comes up. Now it's personable. Within a couple minutes, it wants to kind of meet with these people. It's all of a sudden interested. It's helping relieve some of that stress from that post-traumatic stress. Very, very interesting stuff. But there was something else interesting that I did not point out when I was doing their thing because they also skipped over this so briefly that I almost didn't really catch it. But mm-hmm. I went back in this research and studied it thoroughly, which is that the researcher was John C. Lilly. He was the head researcher. But the person, like we all know in science, who did the actual research are the graduate students who are there every single day. The graduate student in this case was a particular woman, Margaret Howe. Her job was to basically live in an apartment with a dolphin. So they flooded an apartment with like three feet of water. She had a bed that was out of it, a desk that was out of it. She lived with the dolphin all day, every day. Wait, Uh, Did they get a security deposit back? They don't keep them in a pool? Normally, yes. (laughs) No, 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 no. This could not have been yes. real. Yes, and this is a, uh, th- this would allow the dolphin to come in, and they basically lived together in a, in an environment that allowed her <laughs> to teach them English and stuff. It was very, very interesting research. Here's the part that got even more interesting. Around the fifth week of research, she noticed that the dolphin, who's an adolescent dolphin, continually get erections and become sexually aroused, and she started noticing that it had a sexual attraction to her, and there were th- that was an issue. <laughs> So around the fifth week, basically just to speed things along, she began a sexual relationship with the dolphin 
in which she you're you're full of shit right now i'm not full you're of shit pulling my leg she pulled on his dick because <laughs> now they don't get into all the details but she gave the dolphin hand jobs. not without paying they don't get no, into all the details she gave the dolphin hand jobs, and they insinuate that it was more than that that they also had regular sex now keep in mind Dolphins only have sex for about 10 seconds at a time. This is in the article. Yes. You have to send it to me. Yes. I don't buy, I don't buy it. Um, how, she, how hung is a dolphin? Like, yeah. I can't walk. Good thing I can swim everywhere in this yeah. apartment. Did, they, did she get in the, the water or did yes. he pop up on the bed? No, no, no. She was in the water almost the whole time. So it, the entire time she's doing the research, she's in water. I mean, she can get on her bed, which is the only dry <laughs> spot in the entire thing. This is like when Pee Wee Herman tried to marry his chair. But here's the great thing. They came out with a special about her where she actually talks about her sexual relationship with the dolphins. What? Why and, are we not watching this yes, right now? It was a BBC special. And then this guy comes out who's like, yeah, I don't know why this has been such a taboo. I was fucking this dolphin in 71. So this is guy <laughs> who's jealous about all the attention she's getting. Yes. So this dude. Finally, it's in the forefront. It goes gay marriage yeah. and dolphin sex. Yeah. This dude comes out and he's like, yeah, I work. And, and it, he's unclear. He was not a researcher. He was at some kind of dolphin facility, like a SeaWorld type thing in the early 70s doing something. Oh my and God. fucking That's dolphins. That's when my dad worked at SeaWorld. He started. <laughs> He started a relationship with a dolphin, and it's great how he described it. He's like, it was a female dolphin. She was basically... Oh, so it wasn't gay. No, no. <laughs> oh, okay. All yeah. right. Phew. A bunch of really conservative religious oh people just wiped their brow off. Like, oh, okay then. Well, yeah. Westboro just stopped picketing. Yeah. I can't even handle it. So he was saying they had a, a relationship, quote unquote, like a just a regular uh, dolphin person relationship where they're just oh, friendly. Sure, just a regular just, one. They're, they're just friendly. But at night, when they would put her mate into the other tank, they would put her mate away they became close and started having sex. I do like that he waited for... He was at least respectful. <laughs> waited for the male dolphin to get taken into the other place. I'm picturing oh like one day her, her mate comes home. He's yeah. diving out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I picture the mate coming home with a hat and a little dolphin briefcase yeah. and being very surprised. <laughs> Honey. <gasps> oh my God, I'm home early. Nice. I brought fish. Oh, <laughs> Hope you like mackerel. Oh my god! Because he was it's like, not what it looks like. He I'm was just saying this human being. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like the rule that it's not cheating if it's different zip codes. It's not cheating if the phenotype is a little bit off. Different species. Oh my god, I'm crying. But his whole thing was like, listen, you guys, we need to stop stigmatizing this because dolphin <laughs> sex is awesome. <laughs> it's taken too long for this to come to the forefront. We need to talk about fucking dolphins more often. If you guys want to go ahead and look this up, just look up dolphin fucking. You'll find it. Trust me, it's out there. <laughs> it is super interesting. I think this is going to be my next research. Oh if I was in the middle of a master's thesis right now, this would be my next project. Oh my god. This is this has changed my whole Preferred life. dolphin penis size selection. <laughs> Robert Dolphin prefers the six-inch penis. That's yeah. Oh, my God. So anyway, that, that young man, uh, he's actually 63 now. His name is Malcolm Brenner in 71 was, uh, was getting it on with some dolphins. So apparently 60s and 70s was dolphin fuck era. Everyone was on LSD. That's yeah, I guess so. I guess so. But uh, hopefully we can bring that back and maybe inspire some dolphin researchers right oh now or God. maybe just some excited dolphin trainers to get at it. Apparently it's really awesome. It's fun. They love it. They're sensual. Let's go fuck some dolphins. And in doing so, let's move on to finish my story. Oh my God. Finish my story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. Okay, for those of you who are new to this show, this is Finish My Story, in which our research scientist, Jackie, tells us the beginning of a scientific article, and myself and Damien have to finish it for her. Are you guys ready to go? What's the score? I think we're tied. Ten up, all yes, right. Yes, ten up. I'm sorry, it's really hard to follow that story. Yeah. <laughs> you guys like action movies, yeah? Of course. Hell yeah, yeah. bro. <laughs> what are some of your favorite action movies? Now, Damien, I want to be clear. You can have multiple answers for this. I know you like to do that, you know, and it's not normally allowed. But in this question, you can have multiple answers. You're calling me out, but I've given two answers in like the two episodes. He does it all the time. And I've never Bobby. once done that. No. I only give one answer. He gets one answer. Son of a bitch. I hate both of you. And <laughs> okay, so I'm action saying, movies. This is your time. What are yeah. some good Yeah, some now good you can list action movies. Let's list action movies. Uh, Guardians list. of the Galaxy just came out. That was yeah. a good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Human Centipede, also oh, fantastic. Okay. All right. uh, a lot Different of action. kind of action. Also Predator. Action. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. Um, Air Bud. <laughs> 50 First Dates. Oh, okay. Now, now I think we're veering away a little bit. But okay. uh, anyway, 
Certainly guys seem to gravitate towards action movies more than girls, and presumably this is because they get more thrill out of violence and useless plot lines. But when you look at the numbers, action movies top the highest selling movies of most years since 1995. Movies like Batman Forever, Independence Day, The Dark Knight, and The Avengers. Action movies are the third highest grossing genre of movie between the years of 95 and 2014, claiming 17% of the market, which is about $29 billion. They get us revved up for the theater, and they get our adrenaline pumping, making an experience more than just a movie. But in addition to all this excitement, action movies may also be increasing our risk of developing what common disease? Herpes. <laughs> okay. Listen, there's a lot of hooking up going on That's in fair, action yeah. a movies, of, a lot right? Of date nights. Yeah, a lot of people movies. who really enjoy having sex while Bruce Willis is on the screen. You right. know? Yeah, who doesn't want to whip their dick out? Yeah, when they see and it's dark, so you can't tell if somebody has a sore. Huh? That's the issue. Okay. All right. I like that. What about you, Damien? What do you well, think? Well, my one answer. Bobby just had one answer. Yeah. Oh, uh, we'll wait till the end of the segment to count <laughs> to, for, for the tally. <laughs> you, okay. It will be the same answer. So it will still be one. <laughs> Pregnancy. It's okay. twofold. You have men wanting to be like the big, bulging, muscly superheroes. Okay. I, I don't know that pregnancy is a disease. <laughs> it's common. But I, don't know it's I think it's the worst STD you can get. Keep going. Oh. <laughs> and not only that, but like women get all hot and horny looking at the, you know, not only oh, the, yeah. the increase of buff dudes shooting bows and arrows at uh, helicopters yeah. and making them explode just in everyday life, but it also is happening on the screen. Totally. Like women just start ovulating, dropping eggs three at a time. <laughs> That's what I did when I saw the Avengers. I have to comment on this. This is the third week in a row that Damien has essentially stolen my answer. My answer was people are hooking up in movie theaters. They're getting herpes. Damien's, yeah. they're hooking up. They're getting pregnant. It's the same fucking answer. I know. Wait, yeah, no, it's I, a herpes and pregnancy. Okay. Okay. From now on, if you want, I could just email you my answer so you could steal it earlier. No, Jackie, why don't no, you... it's more fun if you guys don't know. I mean, I agree. Damien, okay, maybe, maybe the problem is I'm asking you first. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's going to get another answer. Why don't you... That, that's what's going to happen. It's not another answer. It's my first you answer because you just took my answer. answer. You cocksuckers Damien you. <laughs> Damien I'm, so, I'm sorry that you had to ruin this for us uh, Jackie why don't, why don't I try and fix Damien's mistake mm -hmm. read the question and I'll give a second answer so at least our audience can enjoy two different answers this time <laughs> alright action movies may also be increasing our risk of developing what common disease getting shot in Colorado uh, okay ruin not the most sensitive of answers and not sure that's a disease either lead poison <laughs> okay okay <laughs> Damien, I see you're about to speak. It's not the time. Yeah, one answer, Damien. It's not you the get time. one answer. That's it. Uh, <laughs> Jackie, what's the actual answer? The actual answer is obesity. Ah. This is a small study found that people snacked more while watching action movies than other genres. Ooh. The study's out of Cornell University. It was in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The study divided 94 students into three groups and had them watch 20 minutes of a movie. Charlie's Angel, full throttle. My favorite part of the study was the movie they chose as action, by the way. I'm using air quotes for action. I'm, I'm excited to hear what you guys think. Suffice to say, it hasn't yet been mentioned in our discussion about action movies yet. The first group watched 20 minutes of Charlie Rose as the non-action group. So just new segments. The second group watched 20 minutes of that big action mega hit, The Island. <laughs> <laughs> Directed, Michael Bay. Directed by Michael Bay and starring Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson as human organ harvest clones on a secluded island that learn of their fate as incubators for rich people who can afford to live forever. Good God. Don't get me wrong. I love this movie, but it's more sci-fi in my opinion. This is what happens when you let scientists decide what's action and cool. <laughs> Yeah, they, that is true. But that, that's funny that they would eat more during that. Did they try more movies, or was this just one no. movie that they tried? So they had that group, and then they had a third group who watched 20 minutes of The Island mm -hmm. with no sound. Mm -hmm. The idea being um, this way you could control for audible cues to eat something. All groups were provided ad limitum M&Ms, cookies, carrots, and grapes. The people watching the action film with sound ate 65% more calories than those watching the talk show. The group watching The Island without sound ate 46% more calories than those watching the TV show. And overall, men ate more than women in all of the groups. The hypothesis was that more distracting TV content appears to increase food consumption, with sound being a significant component of this distraction. But there are major pitfalls of the study, including not telling us which snacks people chose. The group's 
gathered themselves so they weren't randomized. I don't, I've never heard of that. That's insane. Okay, so it means yeah. nothing, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, once you start not randomly assigning groups, the, yes. the process essentially completely They say down. they randomly gathered into groups. And I was like, no, 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 that's no. not what that means. Plus, I'd like to see what would happen if they showed the episode of Charlie Rose where he snapped Yasser Arafat's neck. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, totally. This made it into JAMA with those type JAMA of... JAMA Internal Medicine. They also, they didn't JAMA, widen the, the scope. JAMA, the hip-hop magazine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's where I went wrong. They also didn't widen the scope of movie genres. I mean, I feel yeah. like you could have a couple more genres in there. The time of day and time of last meal was not indicated. And the overall physical health or hunger, you know, hungry athletes versus mm-hmm. already obese versus bird eaters, wasn't controlled for. So there's a lot wrong with the study. But I think one thing is clear. Michael Bay makes way too much goddamn money. That's true. <laughs> also, apparently, Liam Neeson is making us all fat. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He has a very particular set of skills, Bobby. It's time to get taken to the gym, motherfuckers. I know you've taken my sandwich. I will find you. (laughs) If the sandwich is returned to my fridge, I won't pursue. So, Jackie, whose single answer was the best? Um, I think Bobby's. The the offensive one about the Aurora shootings is usually the best way to go. (laughs) Yeah. Mentioning that action movies make so, women drop three eggs at a time. Yeah. I'm uh, offended the, by Damien's just thinking he can rip on your answer. Yeah, or then trying to get two in there like an asshole. Mm. I'm All so right. glad there are not actual con- like consequences to this <laughs> to this contest just yet. Oh, there are. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and join us next week for Science Faction 36, in which Damien will face consequences. You know, guys, SeaWorld's not that far. And I happen to have some fish with roofies already in them. You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>